All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to get started now. I'm Evan Borgness Sloan. I'm with the California State Coastal Conservancy, one of the sponsors with Save the Bay and SFEP, SFEP for today's workshop. Thank you for joining us. And I just want to start us with a land acknowledgement. Um, so we acknowledge that the San Francisco Bay is the unceded ancestral homeland of many indigenous people, including the Himron Ohlone Yalkin, Sacklin tribe, the villages of Lashan, the Karkin, Muekma, Ramaytush, Tamian, and Yokut Ohlone, Coast and Bay Miwok, Patwin, and the Ama Mutsin tribal band. The broader San Francisco estuary is also homeland of the Plains Miwok, Wapo, Winton, and Nisanon people. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced any of those names. We recognize that we benefit from living and working in their traditional homeland, and we wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of these tribal communities, and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples of this nation. Um, so yes, we are at day two of the wetland migration workshop. Um, thank you for being here. Day one was really excellent. We heard about engineering designs and restoration techniques and how what we need to do at a policy and regulatory level to scale up to really meet the challenge of sea level rise. Today, we're going to be focusing um, on a number of issues, and uh, we are going to be following the same agenda structure as yesterday. So we'll start with an opening panel, and um, in between each session or panel, we'll have a break. So after our opening panel, we'll have a 15-minute break, followed by a session focused on wetland monitoring and some wildlife, and then another break, um, as, then a session on community engagement, and I should have mentioned the second break is lunch that will be provided. Um, and then our um, last session will be for visions of the future and thinking about youth in these um, spaces. So um, again, similar as yesterday, after each session, we've incorporated time for questions. So please hold all of your questions until all of the speakers have completed their talks. And in person, you can raise your hand and either myself or Will be, will be running around with a microphone. And then if you're online, welcome to everyone on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us. I know we're having a lot of participation online. Um, please enter your questions on the chat and one of our moderators will read your question aloud. Let's see if I missed anything. Ah, and for the people in the room, there is coffee in the back, just like yesterday. Um, and if you weren't here yesterday, the restrooms are just around the corner. You do a right and then your first right and you will see them. So without any further ado, let's get started and I'll hand it over to Annie Burke from Together Bay Area to kick off our panel. I'm happy to share. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're awake. We're here. Uh, you made it. Uh, to those of you who are in the room, thank you for traveling from wherever you traveled. There was traffic today, and a reminder of, of commuting is back. Um, and to those of you on Zoom, hello and good morning. Um, I'm Annie Burke. I'm the executive director of Together Bay Area. Um, Together Bay Area very quickly is a regional coalition of nonprofits, public agencies, tribes, and mission aligned businesses working for climate resilience and equity. Um, uh, I'm also the parent of teenagers. And um, one of the things I heard yesterday is this balance of um, that resonated very much with me as a parent of loving something or someone or some place really, really deeply, investing a lot in it and then letting go. <laughs> and I uh, just want to share that. Um, I also am uh, I'm born and raised here in the Bay Area. Um, I love this place. Um, one of my sons plays baseball at the Twin Creeks uh, sports facility down in Sunnyvale. And I spend a lot of time between games, walking those trails and seeing a work that probably a lot of you are involved in. 
Um, I also love going running up in Point Pinol and I'm very familiar with the, with the place there. Um, I could go on and on. Um, I just, I, I love this place and I'm guessing that a lot of folks here um, do too. Um, I also uh, just want to admit that I'm, I'm from the other side of the tide line. I work like in the uplands. So I'm like an interloper to this conversation a little bit, um, which I think is maybe why I was invited uh, to be here. Um, the work that uh, I do and Together Bay Area does is really from, from the Baylands up um, to the ridge line. And uh, some of uh, the organizations that I work closely with, like Sonoma Land Trust or East Bay Regional Park District and many others, you know, cross that tide line also. Um, but I, I want to bring, um, I'm really excited to be here to, to make a stronger connection between the uplands and the baylands. And I'm really excited to, for this conversation today about um, that transition zone, both literal on the ground transition zone, but also the human transition that we're, we're all living through. Um, I don't think I need to say this, but uh, we're living through a paradigm shift. We're living through some serious big stuff that's happening socially as well as environmentally. Um, and I think it's safe to say that no one here has um, restored wetlands in 2023 before or in 2024 before, like the world is different um, and that we all bring different skills from our lived experiences and our educations and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the but no one's done this before right now. Um, so we're all learners. We're all figuring this out, um, and we all have expertise also. And we're all bringing that to the to the conversation. Um, I want to acknowledge a few things that we're managing every day as we kind of set up this this panel. Um, one is the tension of speed. Um, I heard yesterday morning a lot about needing to hurry up. Um, we need you know we need to move faster. We need to increase the pace and scale of the work that we're doing to address the challenges that we're facing. Um, I think we're also gonna, we're gonna talk today and I'm guessing future panels today, we'll also talk about the need to slow down uh, for relationships, for trust, for community building, for um, community engagement, and that those two things uh, need to happen simultaneously. And that's, a, that's, that's challenging. <laughs> um, and there's not one that's right you know, we have to do both. So it's really a tension that we have to manage, that tension of speed. We also have the tension of scale, um, hyper, hyper local, uh, you know, a particular creek, a bend in a particular creek um, to the a county wide or region wide or statewide, countrywide, global, you know, and so, and one of the things that we'll talk about today is that tension of scale and what, what needs to happen at, what, at, at different scales. And sometimes those are the same. Sometimes those are very different. Um, uh, last thing I want to say, just in, in kind of context, um, is the, this challenge that what's being required of us today in this work, and especially in, in the challenges that's being described in this in this really great workshop, um, is that what's being required of us isn't necessarily what we were taught in school. Um, it's not necessarily how we were brought up. In, in lots of different contexts. And, and that's true regardless of when you went to school. Um, uh, when I went to school, it was not even a part of the, this, this was not on the radar. Um, and even if you went to school recently, uh, you were most likely taught about hazards and risks and, you know, and good luck. <laughs> have fun, you know, figuring that out. So I, I just, there's a lot that we're figuring out together. Um, and my hope is that for the next hour where the, the folks that I'm here with will help illuminate um, what we can do, um, paint the picture of what's happening. And uh, we can talk about the, the, the work of working with communities. Um, so our, our goal, um, for this is, is to talk about how we're one bay from subtitle Bayland Upland, um, to expand the conversation from just the technical, um, to, and transactional to relationships and human centered approaches, um, and talk about the opportunities and challenges. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, it's, but it's also really challenging. So let's acknowledge the challenges, but it's also like, what are we gonna do about it? How can we figure this out together and how do we move forward? 
Um, so I'm going to do some introductions um, of or th these fabulous people are going to introduce themselves, I should say. Um, and then I have some questions for them. Um, and then we'll get into conversation, hopefully up here. And if we have time, we'll have um, opportunities for Q&A from folks both online. Thank you for setting that up so that folks online can can weigh in, but also for the folks here. And if we don't have time for Q&A, we have time at the, everyone here will be here for the break. So we can, we're happy to talk to anyone one-on-one. -on -one. Sound good? All right, drink your caffeine. <laughs> Let's go. Um, so uh, I'm really happy to introduce our panel. We have Violet Wolsena from uh, the founder and executive director of Cl uh, Climate Resilient Communities. Um, we have David Lewis, executive director of Save uh, the Bay. Jeremy Lowe, senior environmental scientist um, from SFEI. And next to me is William Connor, senior project manager from the US Army Corps of Engineers Regulatory North Branch. That's like, it's like around the bend from the South Branch um, or something. Uh, and so by way, instead of doing introductions, because I know if, if you want to go find out, and Caitlin Sweeney, oh thank you. I'm so sorry. You're not in my notes. Um, I'm really glad that you're here. That's right. And now that I see you, I didn't say your name out loud. Thank you, Caitlin, for being here. Um, if you'd like to find out where they went to college or where, where they work or anything about their organizations, I invite you to look, up, look them up on LinkedIn or Google. Instead, what we're gonna do is an introduction um, about hope and about change. Um, so I'm gonna invite each one, um, and maybe we can start with Caitlin and work our way down this way, um, to tell us one way that your organization has changed in the past few years and one um, thing that gives you hope, um, just to start us off um, with something positive. And we're, we're going to move quickly through this section so that we can dive into the into the meat or tofu or chocolate cake of this conversation. Caitlin. Good morning. Um, I'm Caitlin Sweeney. I'm the director of the San Francisco Street Partnership. It's great to be here this morning and on this amazing panel with all these wonderful colleagues. Um, when we were asked to start to think about, start our introductions by what has changed, I just thought, like what hasn't changed over the past three years? I mean, it's really, as Annie said in her introduction, it's really a time of unprecedented change, a paradigm shift in, in our work uh, collectively. Um, and, and for me, when I think about that, especially over the past three years, it's really been the shift of putting ourselves within the ecosystems in which we work um, for the first time um, in everything that we do. So really considering humans as an integral part of the system. And so I think while SFEP, the Estuary Partnership, has been um, shifting towards this for many years, it's really increased in, in pace over the past three years. Um, and probably in the couple of years leading up to the, uh, the release of our 2022 Estuary Blueprint, which for the first time elevated racial equity and environmental justice as a high priority throughout the work that we do um, and shifting our thought process so that we are um, considering equity as a through line uh, in all of our work. So what does that look like for us you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? I thought I'd just throw out a, a couple of examples. Um, so it does look like thinking about, thinking about equity and looking to um, the communities that we work in to um, elevate their concerns uh, and prioritize our work based on needs assessments that are conducted by communities themselves. It also looks like uh, filling a lead scientist position with a social scientist. It looks like creating a social science advisory committee for the first time that we've ever done. It looks like creating a, a people and wetlands work group for the wetlands regional monitoring program. It looks like creating an estuary youth council. These are all things I think you'll hear more about later. It looks like all kinds of ideas and all kinds of amazing creative ways to, to uh, integrate people into our work and to put ourselves into the ecosystem. Um, but I wanna be very clear and honest with you all that this shift and the majority of these ideas, these are not being generated by me personally. 
as the director of the estuary partnership. These are being generated by um, people on my team, by our amazing colleagues, by our amazing partners. Um, for those of us who've been in this field for quite some time, I've been in, working in the Bay for 25 years in the estuary, change is hard <laughs> and it takes a long time. We talked yesterday about uh, regulatory agencies being risk adverse. Well, guess what? We're all risk adverse. Like, that is just our nature. I am risk adverse. I'm concerned about protecting my staff. I'm concerned about making sure that I can secure future funding. I'm concerned about you know, continuing to get the support of my board. Uh, you know, I'm concerned about all of those things. So I'm, I'm managing risk on a day-to-day -day basis. And thank goodness I have people who are constantly pushing me to think differently and operate differently. Um, so I really challenge myself to slow down and listen, um, to continue to, to grow and, and evolve and never stop doing that, to uh, open the door for new possibilities and to be really excited about the time that we're in right now. I feel like this is, I'm, I'm a thousand percent there. Like I am committed. This is exactly where we need to be. In our, in our world, in the work that we do. Um, and so it's just managing that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis is, is my challenge. And I'm 100% there. And what gives me hope? The people. Absolutely 100% the people. All the amazing people that I'm honored uh, and grateful to work with who are so um, committed and uh, creative and passionate about this work. Thank you very much. David. Thanks. I'm not, uh, I'm still not comfortable being like the old guy in the room with uh, 25 years of experience because I want, I don't want to be the old guy. But, um, but uh, I think that is actually in, in thinking back about what's changed in the, not just in the last three years, but in the last 25 years since I came back to the Bay Area to start this job. Um, that's actually the place where I find hope because so much has change. There's a lot of uh, reasons to not be hopeful. And we heard about some of them yesterday, and I want to talk about more of them. Um, but when I came back here 25 years ago, Tidal Marsh restoration was really still mostly an idea and a concept in its infancy. The few efforts that had been tried were mostly viewed as not successful. Um, and now it's a well-established practice and science some examples of that yesterday. Um, at that time, some, some environmental groups were still arguing um, against creating too much tidal marsh because we might lose some important seasonal marsh. That was the battle that I found myself you know, <laughs> stepping into. Um, so a lot of things have changed in the last 25 years, but I think one thing that hasn't really changed, at least from Save the Bay's work and perspective, really going back 60 years, is that we've always gravitated towards trying to actually change the underlying system and the underlying institutions. And that's turned out to be really important. Um, yeah, we fought individual developments that were proposing to fill in the Bay and, and create some damage, but you know, by getting the legislature and Governor Ronald Reagan to establish BCDC, um, the first uh, regional regulation of a water body and the model for every coastal zone management agency in the world. Um, you know, that's, that's had, that's been a system change. And in the nineties, we, we forced uh, a reduction in unregulated dredging and the beginnings of discussions of beneficially reusing that sediment, even before we knew there was a sediment deficit in the Bay and that would be important. And in 2008, we convinced the legislature and the governor to establish the Bay Restoration Authority. Um, and although it took another eight years, convinced 70% of the Bay Area public to tax ourselves and create a half a billion dollars for this work over 20 years. Um, last year, we finally convinced Congress to establish a San Francisco Bay program that we hope will bring even more resources and, and organization to this work. And we, we didn't do any of these things alone. But they really wouldn't have happened without people advocating for a systemic change. And um, I think that's, that's more urgent than ever now, those kinds of changes. I don't have all the answers, but I know, and we heard yesterday about all the problems. So I think 
the best reason I can find to be hopeful is the fact that we uh, all have managed to do that kind of systemic change before. And every time there was opposition and some of the biggest opposition actually came from within our community to making those changes because of what Caitlin was talking about, which I share, the fear of change. You know, we're all, we all expect the future to resemble the past. Gravity will work here. Um, this pen will not float up in the air. That's my expectation. But you know, I think through our anthropogenic change of the world, we've actually lost some of the privilege of of uh, slowing down. Um, we do need to find ways of incorporating more views and more people into this work, but we've actually lost the privilege of slowing things down just for the purpose of delay because we're scared of change. Um, that's not that's not going to work. So uh, I guess that was my roundabout way of expressing some hope. <laughs> I can feel it. I mean, it's just oozing with positivity and hope. Thank you, David. <laughs> Violet. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Violet Saena, um, founder and executive director of Climate Resilient Communities. So I come into this space um, originally. I'm from the islands and moved to the to the Bay Area. Lived in East Palo Alto. That's where I landed. And of course, moving from a large body of water surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. Of course, I wanted to move also close to near another body of water and I ended up in the Bay Area. Um, but I also bring um, a lot of lived experiences um, as a community organizer, um, someone who has been advocating for small island countries um, at the United Nations level to um, you know advocate for um, support for communities that have been disproportionately impacted by climate change and sea level rise. But not only that, um, also in my own nature as a, an islander, um, I look around the environments around me. That's my home. Um, I see a lot of uh, uses of the resources, the land, the, the ecosystems, all that is part of my DNA. Um, so I started this work and to the change. So I came with all these experiences and started working um, in this space, um, supporting communities that are at the front line, front line of sea level rise. Um, and, you know, back in the day, I think I started this work back in 2016 um, working in working um, with Ectera, a lot of the conversation then was around mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, but very little about adaptation. And for communities um, that I served, um, started from East Power to at that time, many of the communities weren't engaged in any of these planning processes. They weren't even aware of the impacts and the threats that climate impacts had on their communities and also the lives of the people living there. So I did a lot of work um, trying to shed light on the value of engaging communities with all these planning processes and all these efforts that our states, our federal governments, the cities, the counties were trying to, um, you know, build to protect communities. The missing element was the communities themselves, the people that will be impacted by all these different um, infrastructures built or um, policies in place. And so my role, my work started from trying to make um, shed light that you have, you have support from the community if you engage the community. I'm happy to hear from Annie, you know, about yesterday that you also talk about slowing down because with community involved, especially the most vulnerable communities here in our Bay Area, you have to remember that most of these communities not only are exposed directly to sea level rise, but also the history, the long history of 
marginalization redlining that disable them. So we really need to think about how to engage communities in a way that we are mindful of that disability, that these communities need resources to engage. They're going to need time to engage, just like you know, anyone who you know, get hit by a car, right? You have a disability. And this is an analogy that one of the community leaders that I work with um, shared. You know, you're going to need help to standing up. The same analogy, same issues that we feel community needs. So engaging communities is my key priority. Um, but not only that, building that relationship. A lot of the people that I'm sitting here sharing this panel, I have been engaged. We were partners in a lot of projects. But that's the, the beauty of it. I bring in my organization bring in the voices of the community or even creating that table um, in communities for partners like what we have or all of you here that can come to the community and have conversations equally, seeing the community as the expert on the ground and you also bring that other expertise to build solutions um, together with the community. So a lot has changed. I remember the first, um, um, very similar to this uh, um, conference, I also spoke one of the big, um, I think it was an SFEI conference before COVID. And, and I talked about, you know, the lack of resources, funding allocated to community engagement work to engage the community. Um, and, and a lot has changed, a lot has changed now. My organization, we have a grant with from Coastal Conservancy to build rain gardens and cistern systems that will help reduce runoff to the bay. Um, we're also, we're gonna be talking about another project, um, a grant from San Francisco, um, um, the Measure AA grant um, that it's a, it's a community um, project that we're, myself and Barbara from Grassroots Ecology are gonna be talking about um, later today um, to engage the community with uh, coastal restoration activities. Um, and also um, since our work, um, the Safer Bay project have also engaged the community and the community have become that advisory committee to this project in Belhaven, in Menlo Park and in East Pawato. So a lot has changed and that gives me hope because now um, we were isolated um, and we try to um, you know, create that opportunity not only for the communities, but also for the partners to be able to join hands and work together with us to finding solutions and protecting our coastal environments, so. Thank you, Violet. Really, very glad you're here. Jeremy? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy Lowe. <clears throat> I'm a senior scientist at the San Francisco S Institute. Um, I think, David, I might actually beat you in age because I, I feel it. And uh, <clears throat> But come with age also comes experience. And I think that's one thing that is very valuable that we have in the room and elsewhere is the, the fact that we've done uh, wetland restoration for a long time. So we're maybe ahead of the game in understanding how the shoreline works and how it, it changes. Perhaps some of the other stake and some of the other stakeholders that are more recently looking at the bay. Because as, as in recent years, as our understanding of the climate has changed and we're understanding that we've got to adapt to it, there's a lot more focus on the bay. I've noticed that from uh, the early 2000s when you could do a restoration project almost in peace with better people bothering you, <laughs> a few things to, to think about. Now, there's very much is a focus and a lot more people, a lot more infrastructure is involved, a lot more community involvement, which is great. But it does make these problems, it has changed the nature of our projects. Um, there are many more stakeholders engaged in the, in the management of the, of the bay now. Um, there are many more voices around the table, which is good. We need more voices. We need to listen to those voices as well. Um, there are many more objectives. So that we need to think about multiple benefit projects, which is great. Um, but with all of those as a result, the projects now are becoming much more complicated. 
There are many more moving parts. Now, complicated projects or complicated problems are not difficult to solve. You just have to set them apart and tease them apart and work on them systematically. The problem we have is that they're not just complicated, they're complex. And complex project, uh, problems are more about understanding what we're trying to achieve, which is quite difficult. We go to projects and there's a number of stakeholders, everybody has their own objective. And trying to marry those up is difficult. Um, we have an uncertain system that we're working with. We don't know how climate change is gonna change. And that's uh, difficult when a lot of stakeholders need certainty, the discussion about risk that we're having. And you cannot, particularly with nature-based systems, you cannot promise certainty. Uh, they're all bringing together different cultures, like community cultures, but also bureaucratic cultures. I mean, if you get Caltrans and you get FEMA in the same room, there's not much headspace for anybody else. And they, all these interrelated factors, they don't lend themselves to tried and trusted, tested approaches. We heard that yesterday. Things are changing. Dropping the pen in the future may go up rather than down if we're not careful because we don't know how all these systems work together. So the challenge of increased complex projects, which slows progress, is compounded by the ticking clock we have of climate change, which is accelerating the need. And Violet eloquently said about talking about slowing things down. We need to slow things down and speed things up. We need to slow down the processes, but we need to speed up the results. And I think that's gonna be our big challenge that we have. But I shouldn't end in doom and gloom. Uh, according to Annie, um, I'm supposed to say something that's gonna give us hope. So I am gonna do that. Um, there are lots of things that are gonna give us hope. They are, and uh, we've heard of them in the talk yesterday and today. We, we have a lot of knowledge for managing these wetlands and the natural bay, and we have a lot to share with the other, um, the other stakeholders. We have a collaborative community. Uh, there's, everyone here is working on projects. We, we bid for RFPs, we do things, but we work together, we share knowledge, and we're willing to share that knowledge. And we have a region that values the bay enough to tax itself, thanks to David. But in these complex projects I'm involved in, I do see some missteps regularly, every week. But I also see major strides coming forward. And I think that gives me real hope. And I think it does give us a good future, but we have to wait for time to tell. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And our final contestant here on the panel is Will. I know it hurt now. Um, <laughs> so good morning, everybody. My name is William Connor. I'm the supervisory project manager for the Corps of Engineers, North Branch. It does not fit on a business card. Um, so I'm up here today, and you know we want to talk about change. And this uh, it's a complex subject when you come from a regulatory agency. Um, change is not typically in our vernacular. It, it comes slowly, painfully, and, and with great fear and uncertainty. Um, I'm sure we. Many of us are aware of that. We've recently had a redefinition of waters of the US. That is our, our major change. I, I would prefer not to talk about that here. Um, <laughs> but instead, when I think about change over the last eight years, I've been working for the San Francisco district. The one that comes to mind is our tribal engagement. So I came here from Hawaii. Um, I was a marine biologist by training. I do regulatory law by necessity. And what I've seen over the time here as a project manager and as I've worked my way up the food chain, is it's how we have gone from tribal engagement being a box we check on our documentation to say that we have done something to actually meaningfully try to develop relationships with the tribes in our area, with trying to communicate with them for the projects, the plans, and the future kind of intent. This is obviously limited by the fact that the core East Regulatory does not develop our own projects. We don't propose projects we take what's brought to us and, and try to run it through the environmental framework. And, and, and with that, that, that has, you know, we've seen our Office of Council develop the tribal liaison whose only job it is to, to really help us engage those communities, to try to make sure we are not leaving anyone kind of by the wayside as, as, as we plumb our way through our decision documents and, and getting you guys your permits. 
and we see that, you know, my thing about personal examples for that is, is when we have about the uh, Great Rancheria, where, you know, I have what to think, I would hopefully think a very positive relationship with their, their TIPO out there. You know, we do come to loggerheads for quite a few projects because obviously what their concerns are may not always align with what applicants may want, with what we are predispositioned to kind of move towards. But we have together, you know, through a series of scheduled meetings, through on-site deliberations, we have really kind of come to a working relationship that, that hopefully involves at least no one leaving away bitter and hurt, right? That, that if we can't necessarily give them everything that they want or, or possibly even deserve, but we can at least make sure that they are that they feel heard and that they feel that they are when they engage with us, that it, it is with the intent that we do listen and we, that we do attempt in our, um, in our process to, to make sure that they remain whole for any of these projects. Uh, I wanted to keep it under two minutes. Uh, so when we talk about hope uh, and something positive, uh, aside from uh, hopefully that was positive overall, but that the fact that that I'm here at this table is, is, is positive and hopeful. Um, the core has really prided ourselves on beating neither proponents nor opponents to any particular projects. And that largely leaves us almost feeling as if we're dissociated and just non-engaging for, for projects of, of passion like these. You know, these, these uh, large ecosystem restorations are, no one's doing this to drive the Lamborghinis home. We, 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 do, we do it because we, we care about the environment and we want to make sure that we have a resilient uh, you know, ecosystem you know, for in the future and for future generations. And the, hopefully regulatory has to a large degree understand you know, that we need to be at the table for these to know that to show that we are, we are here, that we are engaged. You know, obviously we can't raw, raw, raw for these projects and, and say we need to get these in but we can definitely make sure that we don't seem like a faceless, emotionless uh, government bureaucracy that's only in your way. Uh, I know that, you know, Stuart, if you were here yesterday, had his uh, regulatory work cloud of, of doom and gloom, and we can't necessarily, you know, magic those issues away, you know, simply because these projects are, are good and beneficial. But hopefully we can at least be, feel like we are not detrimental to getting these in, that, you know, that we use provide our, our useful and, and helpful and hopefully at the end of the day end with a better project overall. Thank you. Well, I'm, and everyone here, I'm so glad each of you are here today to be at this table, both literally and figuratively. I mean, to have different people come together and have a conversation is so powerful um, that my, my hope is that what we're starting what, what, what we're about to discuss doesn't end at 1015, but continues on and the relationships can continue on. So um, thank you to you and to everybody for, for being a part of this. Um, let's, let's continue. Um, Violet, I would love to start with you and start with people. Um, could you tell us a story of a project about how people have been involved in in the environmental restoration and wetlands migration. Um, you know, what does it actually mean for the people? I think we, my, my, my assumption of the audience is that we know what it means for, um, for the birds, for the plants. What does it mean for the community that you work with? And, and the more specific, the better. I will try to be specific. <laughs> um, so, um, so, I'd like to share, um, like I mentioned, that we have this project. Um, it's actually called Baylands Habitat Restoration Community Engagement Project um, in East Palo Alto. Um, this is a project funded by San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority through the Measure AA grant. And the main purpose of this project is to enhance, to restore and enhance marsh upland transition zone habitats. Um, when we developed this project, um, before, before the opportunity came with Measure AA, um, my organization um, led a community vulnerability assessment in East Palo Alto. This is a community-led 
assessments where community identified their vulnerabilities to climate change and sea level rise, and also prioritize adaptation strategies from the community's uh, perspective and priorities. And we were very, um, during the engagement process, what we often heard from the community is the value that they hold on the very limited open spaces that they have, Pooley Landing and Ravenswood. They um, were engaged um, during that vulnerability assessment process, like meaning we hold meetings there, the city at Cooley Landing. And that's when most of the community's um, members um, shared the value that these spaces have and the hope that they rather see these kind of open spaces protected. Um, they see it as solutions um, or adaptation solutions for uh, sea level rise. And so knowing uh, those priorities, um, when the opportunity came, um, we worked with grassroots ecology um, to put together the proposal for this project. And CRC, my organization, we were um, responsible for the community engagement piece. So of course, um, you know, the way that I designed the community um, engagement um, piece of this project was to make sure that resources will be funneled down to the community so that community will have the resources to participate and engage. And also um, another strategy that we, we, um, we did with the project, um, not only um, making resources available, um, but also give the community leaders the opportunity to take ownership and so we have started this project already. Um, there was some delay due to permitting um, processes. We're gonna go into detail um, about this project later on today. So please stay and, and hear Barbara present the project and I will help her. But um, engaging the community, we were able to bring, engage three other community organizations. So it's not just CRC, um, and the climate change community team that we've built, but we've also enabled other CBOs who um, don't really work around coastal restoration projects. Uh, we engage Anamatangi Polynesian Voices. This is a Pacific Island um, uh, in, uh, organization. Um, uh, St. Mark's Church, it's a church um, that works directly with mostly African um, uh, African communities and also Al Comité de Vecinos. Um, these are, this is another organization that works directly with um, Latinx communities, um, especially communities that are facing housing hardships. So these other organizations have come together, partner with us um, to, um, you know, to build up a, a program that we will engage the communities because most of the times, um, nonprofits and organizations that do come to East Palo Alto to host events or create volunteer opportunities, you will only see um, people from the other side of the freeway taking up those opportunities. You don't see community members come out on cleanup days or a restoration project unless, unless um, you put resources in the engagement process, um, also enable resources where communities will get some financial uh, support so that they will um, be able to come out. So all these other um, things and dynamics uh, we have to consider when when we are um, engaging the community. So we have a like I said, we will share more about this project after later today. But as soon as our community leaders came together to design, um, we heard so much about the use of the space, right? Before we only talk about restoring the species and, and all of, you know, pick up uh, garbage. But when we started having conversations with other community leaders, you start hearing about 
what are what what are the connections, right? Their connections to the space or their uses of the space. We even had conversation like nobody really swims there at Kuli Landing. Why not? Why why aren't we swimming? Um, especially with heat waves. How come we're not considering that space as a cooling, um, you know, as a space for community, the access when there's a heat wave? We've never, uh, and then there's a question about permitting and we don't know if the, you know, if the water is safe. So all of that will be explored, but we never thought of exploring it until the community came into the conversation. Great, thank you. Maybe for later, I wanna know why there isn't swimming at Cooley Landing. That's another panel. Um, uh, thank you very much for sharing. And I hope we're gonna circle back. We're gonna, uh, everyone's gonna share something and then we're gonna bounce around um, ideas and, and building on things. So thank you, Violet. Um, Jeremy, I'm gonna go to you and, and can you provide an example of an easy wetlands, uplands project from say ten, five, 10, I don't know, pick your time frame. Pick an, what, what was an easy project in, in, in the earlier times? And what's a more challenging project of today or what you see in five to 10 years? Like, can you help us kind of juxtapose what, what used to be the case and where we're going? Um, and, and especially through the lens of like human communities. I mean, so not the technical components of it necessarily, although I'm sure that's a part of it, but also in terms of thinking about community engagement. So the simpler ones, a lot of them were simple in the old days, and it was simply a, a restoration, maybe a setback levy, and a breach, and then there was the discussions with the community, there were three meetings, the beginning and the middle and the end, and then there were um, uh, infrastructure or other stakeholders got involved if the restoration affected that, if you had to raise a power line or something like that. Projects today, of course, are much more complex because we are not dealing with just the restoration, we are dealing with shoreline adaptation. There's a big expectation for nature-based solutions. There's a growing concern about what the impact that, the, 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 how, the, how the communities will benefit from the restorations and the, the, and the natural systems that we're restoring. So there's a lot, a lot of change in the, the nature of the projects. And there's a lot of change in, I think, in how we communicate and work together. Um, I, I, I keep thinking about Highway 37, um, which is a big project in the North Bay. It's a road project, but it's also a lot of restoration going adjacent to it. Um, and there's great opportunities there. Um, it's difficult to engage a community, though, because there are not that many people actually living next to the road. The, the people who are affected live in, in, in Solano, live in uh, Marin, live in the surrounding area and use the road. They also take advantage of the, the natural environment that we have there and, and access it. So talking about the communities, <clears throat> it, it's difficult to uh, communicate with them. And I've seen, the, I, I'm not responsible for those efforts, but I've seen it's, it's difficult to do over Zoom and polls and virtual public meetings. Um, and we heard yesterday about the need to bring people up to speed and then ask their opinion. It's difficult to do all of that in a, in a condensed space of time. What I do see of hope is not communicating during, for an individual project and, and leafleting the building saying, hey, we've got a project coming, come to the meeting. I'd like to see more continual engagement with the communities, more continual engagement with the stakeholders in an area, not specific to a project. And I'm thinking here about things like the, the Nevada Creek Bayland strategy, which we're just starting, where we're looking at a large area which has people living in it, which has major infrastructure and stakeholders in it. But before we decide on the projects, we're going to talk about what are we, what are we trying to achieve here as a group? What are the, what are the objectives? Understanding what your, the, neighbor, the, the other stakeholders need, kind of look, thinking about how we're going to do trade-offs before we start thinking about the individual project. And I, I see that as well in a number of places in Alameda as well. They're looking, they have a group which is, uh, is being formed between um, the, the local cities and uh, CBOs and so on, talking about what we're trying to do in this area. And I think that is a big, as a communication tool, it allows people to not only understand what other people are doing, it, 
people get experience knowing each other. They also get to know the projects and the, in the issues. So we, we end up with a good informed discussion as opposed to putting people in very difficult positions about saying, well, do you, do you like this project? What do you want to see change? How do you want to do it? And I think that's, a, with, it's not a good thing about climate change, but climate change is going to be with us. And so keeping these groups together in perpetuity, I think, in a long running thing, should be, a, should be an aim that we have. Mm -hmm. Keeping them together, because I think with that, not only do we get better projects, but I'm hoping we can also get better stewardship. Mm -hmm. People have ownership of the short line mm -hmm. and have ownership of the projects as well. They've all been part of that decision process. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a good example of that. I, have, I see the seeds of it, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm hoping that's going to be what, we, what we, comes out of a lot of the <coughs> Um, big, more regional or sub-regional scale planning mm -hmm. is a more sub-regional conversations that we don't have a fights about the individual projects. Mm -hmm. We've already established uh, an understanding of what each of us thinks out of it. We'll come back in five to 10 years to see if there's examples that you would, I'll ask you that question again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great, thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, well, let's come to you next. Um, from your perspective and the role you play, what are some of the common permitting challenges that are brought to your desk? Um, bring us into your world a little bit. What do you see and, and um, uh, what do you, um, how are you individually and you as part of Army Corps expanding work from just the technical to also the relationships, um, kind of building on what Jeremy just said of uh, not just focused on what the outcome is and we're moving towards that outcome, but building relationships with communities and, and moving towards shared goals. Uh, another you know, challenging um, discussion point for the core, because again, we, as someone, as an agency that doesn't propose any projects, we, we are just on the receiving end. And we end up quite frequently in the situation that Jeremy was mentioning, where, you know, here's a project, tell us what you think, and then we're going to go on our way. Um, and so the, the development with the community is obviously when it, when it occurs outside of projects, it has to be opportunistic and it, it has to kind of be with entities that have the capacity to reach out, to coordinate on just general life goals. Uh, an example of this I can think of is the Yurok tribe up in Northern California. Uh, we did a large dam remediation removal up there and, and I was on the monthly calls with the, the council and I was getting grumbled at every month for not moving fast enough. And, you know, it's a form of relationship building uh, to a certain degree. And it, it really does allow us to kind of, you know, expand. Because once you start knowing people's names, their faces, you have the opportunity to reach out. And so now when we're doing the wildfire recoveries up there, you know, they, they reach out to me directly. And we have discussions on no specific projects. But we can start talking about this is generally the work that needs to be done. How can we start interfacing with their, our regulatory agencies in advance, planning the projects in advance, to really kind of be able to get to the groundwork faster and spend less time in these meetings grumbling at me. Um, but, you know, our, when we think about the communities, we don't think about just about the native communities, the affected peoples, while they are important, you know, we also consider largely the regulated public to be part of that community that we need to reach out to. I'm, I'm sure that we, all of us here yesterday heard that underarching theme that, that regulatory is seen as a burden for projects. And we, uh, not to repeat my intro, but you know, we can't magic these things away, but we can try to develop our tools, our relationships and our internal processes to try to make this a, uh, as, as least painful as possible. And to kind of bring it back to what Sarai was talking about yesterday about the BRIT, one of the, tool, one of the things that we've done that I'm, I'm fairly proud of is establish the BRIT and really kind of get that framework to kind of accept funds and be able to expend them and dedicate a project manager specifically for these sort of projects versus you submit an application and maybe you'll hear back from one of our PMs in about six weeks. So this allows us to kind of be out there, reach out to the, to have a point of contact that you can come out and have consistent reviews, have consistent feedback and develop consistent processes. And that has that side effect in that, you know, that our project managers now reach out to the same communities. They become a, a known, persons, they become an available resource for the community to reach out to. And that really allows us to, again, I think one of the, one of the more valuable things we can do is simply just be a face and be present. Now, again, you know, we can't always give 
the best answers or the most preferable answers, but you know, it's certainly a step forward when we can be present at the meetings, we can be in the communities, we can be that that ear or that person you can reach on the phone. Um, sorry. And so there's no real specific kind of projects that I want to talk, you know, that I can really talk about, but the general challenge is, is you know, we are faceless and we are slow. And we, we, we acknowledge that, you know, we, we do have an actual community, we are working uh, in, the part, in the policy management to actually kind of develop a more streamlined guidance. So that way we're not playing the game of find the rock with our, our, our um, regulated public where we just, we need more information, but we're not gonna tell you when you get it. Just keep providing us stuff until we say yes. And one of the things we are, so we are working on that to be able to try to, you know, at least a, a, a checklist or something more concrete or discreet that says this is what you can do to help get through that process. And that's how I feel we can best benefit the communities, both regulated as well as the affected communities in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Will. I hear um, uh, in all that's been shared so far, this, uh, this uh, truth that we're individual people working for organizations part of a larger system. And sometimes those all align beautifully. And sometimes those things are challenging <laughs> and that you as a person um, are actually not faceless. You're actually a, a human being working within a larger, much larger system. Um, uh, so I, I just want to acknowledge that, 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 that um, there's a few different scales here and I'm going to use that as a segue to you, David. Um, you know, what's getting in our way and talking about things at an individual level, organizational level, um, and systems level, and, and, and where are the, the rubs there? Where are, the, where are the bumps or the walls that we're running into? Um, and, and how do we get out of our own way as human beings to doing the work that we, we all know we want and need to do? Um. Well, I think we need more people, um, more of a certain kind of people with a certain kind of orientation. Um, and each of us, busy though we are, needs to do more. Though, frankly, we need more violets and we need more CRCs. And it's totally understandable why um, communities that are uh, still trying to recover from decades or a century of, of disregard and underinvestment um, that uh, it's, it's hard to develop community organizations that have the capacity to do this work because this isn't the only problem that they're facing. Um, just, just housing people, having jobs for people, uh, public safety, these are all crucial issues. So having organizations on the ground that are also trying to look forward at climate threats, um, that's, we need more of that. Um, we need the people who aren't in this room to be in this room or in this conversation. It's great that there are some uh, key representatives from regulatory agencies, uh, but there aren't enough and there aren't all the decision makers in the room from BCDC and the Water Board um, and EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. And there are so many agencies um, involved. Um, but I think that's really important because, uh, you know, if everybody has their blinders on and their mindset, but if all of us actually know how challenging and urgent this work is, um, th there's a disconnect there, then people aren't doing all they can. Um, so I think on a systems level, one, one thing that uh, uh, I'm convinced we need um, is uh, more resources, more money, and that's a lot of what Say the Bay has been working for, but we need a, a specific kind of money um, I think it's very easy to see that the rich communities in the Bay Area will find a way to do the climate protection that they need to do. San Francisco voters have already passed hundreds of million dollars of bond just to start Embarcadero seawall reconstruction. Um, but the communities that don't have that tax base, don't have those resources, don't have that political leadership, um, where are they, where are they going to get? the money to even figure out what needs to be done, let alone implement it. We need a pooled fund in the Bay Area. And um, this is difficult to create, uh, but that is, that is the best thing that we can do to address 
you know, decades of underinvestment and, and redlining. And, you know, there are models of income redistribution uh, in this country. Um, most of them are 50 years old from the Great Society days. Uh, but with the passage of Measure AA, I, I just want to highlight that um, there were people who were very worried that every dollar taxed from a particular county wasn't necessarily going to be going back to provide projects in that county. Um, and the public, that's not what the public wanted. That's not what the public cared about. We saw in poll after poll that people wanted the whole bay to be improved and the whole ecosystem to be improved. And uh, it was only the local elected officials and the county supervisors who were worried that they wouldn't be able to defend and support this if, if you know, money wasn't coming back proportionally. So I think that's an indication of, that a, a system change like that um, requires a, a public education and also requires a politician education. Um, and then I think the last, the last thing on this, which is my, uh, I guess calling it a pet peeve kind of understates the importance of it. But um, I think we, especially in the environmental community, uh, have achieved so much over the last century um, by saying no to bad things and, and stopping bad things. And we're very good at it. And a lot of the laws that we rely on and that agencies rely on have that at their core. Well, it's ways, very, very um, effective ways of, of stopping bad things from happening. Um, but as a community, with some exceptions, we haven't gotten very good at saying yes. And I think that we who are knowledgeable about the urgency of climate change and the urgency, not just of, of climate mitigation, but of adaptation, we need to be willing to confront people who don't want to make the changes uh, for any particular reason, whether it's not in my backyard or this isn't my favorite thing, or what about this one species that I've been working to protect for decades that's already consigned to extinction because of the climate change that we've baked in. We need to be able to say that if you don't agree that this is the way to solve that problem, you can't just say no, you have to come up with a better solution. We have to insist on that. Um, and I think this is also true in the funder community. Violet alluded to the continued focus on, on mitigation more than on climate adaptation, even though we know we have to do this kind of adaptation. And the funder community, uh, the, especially the private funder community in philanthropy is complicit in this. And the great uh, philanthropic institutions and individuals who have focused on climate as a priority are still primarily focused on climate mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, very important work. But it is a frustration, not just of folks who are trying to receive money, but of some of the funders that they're there has not been this move to fund adaptation. It should have started 20 years ago. Uh, the reason that's given is that well, if, if we admit that we have to do this adaptation, we undercut efforts to reduce climate emissions, people might give up on that. And that is uh, such a ridiculous answer, unacceptable answer. So again, I think you know each of us has a role as a scientist, as a regulator, as a practitioner, as an educator, um, but we also have this knowledge about what needs to change. And I think we, we must be the vanguard of, of uh, forcing those kinds of changes or at least confronting the resistance. I see a Star Wars movie in there, confronting the resistance. Um, finally, uh, Caitlin, um, can you talk about scale? Um, and, you know, we've, we've, mentioned very specific places. We've talked about um, commonalities across the region. Um, how does, um, how do regional organizations support local efforts? Local efforts tie into regional organizations, um, you know, and you can go up and down. Um, if you could talk about that and tell us um, uh, what that exchange and partnership is like and what could it be like? What, where, where should we go in terms of the di working at different scales. I think <clears throat> I think about scale all the time. <laughs> it's fascinating. I mean, especially as we evolve. You know, Jeremy talked about local projects being so much more complex than they used to be, and there's a recognition, um, you know, around the room that success 
really needs to be locally driven and locally led. So what is the role of a regional entity such as mine, particularly a non-regulatory entity? You know, so we don't have that sort of carve out. So what is locally driven, locally led, regionally supported look like? Um, so, I, you know, I think we're, we're, we're digging into that. And we have some examples. I mean, one, one example that comes to mind is, you know, we have um, a responsibility as a regional entity to look after our regional assets. So, you know, thinking about uh, wetlands systems or our trails or even our transportation networks as regional assets that we have a responsibility to consider when supporting local projects um, and taking that more regional scale view. Um, we also, you know, are kind of responding to what we're hearing from our partners on the ground in terms of what our role should be. So, for example, uh, we are involved in se several uh, uh, OLU, Operational Landscape Unit Scale, efforts um, in different regions of the Bay. And we're looking for what is emerging as common themes or common challenges among those efforts and where can we step in to kind of assist, for example, providing just a, you know, even a forum for all of those who are engaged in these uh, regional or sub-regional or local efforts, a forum to discuss those areas. So Heidi Nutters yesterday uh, mentioned the Transforming Shorelines Collaborative. That is one example of you know, where we uh, see that there's a need for um, providing that forum to discuss specific projects or um, specific technological challenges even. Um, we're, we're listening for, yeah, other common challenges and trying to respond such as the, the regulatory pathways challenges. We're hearing that everywhere. Um, so we're embarking on you know, various efforts to uh, help shepherd successful regulatory pathways for these innovative, locally based, locally led, locally driven efforts. Um, or even sort of keeping an eye out for very specific needs. Um, Heidi again mentioned yesterday, stepping in to manage construction for a project, not something we thought we'd be involved in, but what we were hearing as a need from some you know, of our um, partners that had lower capacity, some of the local municipalities who really didn't have the capacity to manage a construction project. As she said, but stay tuned to see if that's uh, you know, something we wanna continue to stay engaged in, but clearly that's a need around the region um, to, to help in that way. Or another example is we have allocated staff time and, and resource to, um, from a grant, a certain amount of hours to provide grant writing assistance to local partners, not writing grants for them, but sitting down and talking about how do you develop a budget? What does uh, deliverables look like? How can you structure this so that you'll be successful in, in accessing this grant? So um, yeah, always thinking about how to, how to scale up, how to scale down, <laughs> how to, um, go back and forth uh, based on, on need and, uh, and what we're hearing is those, those key emerging challenges and opportunities um, that are resulting from local efforts. Great, thank you. Listening is a big piece of that and, and the importance of communication in both directions because maybe what you, if somebody's working very locally and they think that what they're working on is totally unique to that place, regional organizations might say, no, actually not, not unique to you, common everywhere. You should talk to so-and-so over here because they, so the, the real importance of that communication. Um, we're almost at time um, and I'd like to keep talking for a long time and I wish we could keep going, um, but I want to, to not get in trouble. Um, so uh, we're gonna have one last question um, and we're gonna do this kind of lightning round um, and we're just gonna, go popcorn style, so whoever would like to go, with what is one wish that you have for the practitioners here today in this room and, and watching on Zoom? Um, what is one wish that you have? And that could be an invitation to do something. It could be a, a wish for them and how they approach their work. Um, what's something that you have to offer to, to our audience today? And I'll just open it up to whoever would like to go first. I see David and then Jerry. Yeah, I'm shy, so I'll go uh -huh. um, I encourage people to speak truth to power. Um, and there's ways of doing that directly. When you see problems, to call them out um, without uh, endangering yourself, uh, you know, in your organization or in your life. Um, 
there, there are ways of communicating unofficially off the record uh, to people who can carry forward your message. But for those of us who are uh, who have worked inside government and outside government, um, I, I in particular am most appreciative of the people who um, are insiders who find ways of communicating effectively with outsiders and outsiders outside of, of you know, official agencies who find ways of, of communicating effectively with insiders because um, uh, we all have our roles and our jobs, but um, uh, for people who can see what needs to be done, I, I encourage everybody to be creative about finding ways of translating that into action. Fantastic, thank you. Jeremy? Um, yeah, I agree with the, the, the truth power, um, but I also would like to think about how we can be more empathetic mm. in, our, in our projects and understanding the, the positions that other people are in. It's mm -hmm. not easy being a regulator, I don't think. And my apologies, you've done a great job. We have a bay that we can work with, so <laughs> I've got to say that. And also I must apologize to the practitioners belittling the previous projects. They were really complex and really hard. They're just the present ones are even harder. Um, so empathy, I think, is important because we need to understand, particularly with a wider group of people in the conversation, we need to where, understand or try and understand where people are coming from. That's going to be difficult because I'm from a different culture. I, I don't understand necessarily, but I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think that's coming in with eyes open and listening, open ears open, and really trying to understand what we're trying to achieve as together on the shoreline. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. I feel like we're, we can just keep building on this. Um, so truth to power and empathy uh, and using those to um, allow for risk, to take risk ourselves, to challenge our managers, to allow us to take risk, challenge our boards to allow us to take risk, um, to talk about risk um, with, yeah, with empathy and understanding and, um, and respect. I can just add, um, maybe uh, reiterate um, what was mentioned about listening. I think many of us, um, when we are having conversations with communities, um, there's no true listening, meaning listen and understand what is being said, but not listen to respond, right? And, and I think a lot of the times when we forget to listen to the communities, um, we miss the opportunity. We miss the opportunity that's been shared. Um, so I just like to encourage practitioners um, and also partners um, engaging communities that, you know, that's one key thing and that's one key element of building trust. We move with the speed of trust, um, we listen, and that's how we know what the next step will be. Thank you. Well, hopefully I'm close enough. So, you know, if we're talking about these kind of aspirational things, I think one I would lean for is, is optimism. Um, I think we all recognize that the challenges and the fixes that we have are, are monumental. They are complex and, and they are challenging. But I think that what we see, you know, at least from the regulatory standpoint, is, you know, we see those challenges that, we have, that people come to and they have and that not all of them make it through, but we, we do see projects come to completion. We do see those end results, right? So when we're involved in that process, you know, you guys have your projects and you know, you're focused on the ground trying to get the results and the benefits that you're aiming for. But you know, we have a little bit further view of that in, and we get to see that you know, through all that, all, all that pain, all those troubles, all those headaches that you can get a benefit you can get these things that you want the outcomes that that you deem necessary and so you know take heart in that you know that that we are all trying to work for a, a better more sustainable future well folks truth to power empathy take risks deep listening and optimism that's a great way to start a Tuesday. And if you'll please join me in thanking these fabulous people for their time.